right. Are you ready to say hello? Teddy darling? Yeah. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. That's yeah. it. That's hello from Teddy and hello from me. This is Anna and Teddy and Pets Talk. And I am <laughs> Teddy and I. I think I nearly forgot you there, didn't I? And you didn't want that. So Teddy and I are very happy to welcome Andrew Hale from Dog Centered Care with us today. So hello, Andrew, and welcome. Hi, Anna, and hi, Teddy. Good to see you, Teddy. I totally agree with you, Teddy. I totally agree with you. <laughs> Teddy is saying this is very hot. And I'm glad the fan is on. So if anybody can hear a funny sound, it is for Teddy's benefit that I have the fan um, because he does get hotter than me. So it's all that fur, isn't it, Teddy Bear? All the fur, isn't it? Would you like to have a haircut next week? <laughs> <laughs> Teddy That's says, yes. well, it might be a good idea, but it's not my favorite activity. <laughs> I, hear, I, hear you on that. I hear you on that, Teddy. Oh, so anyway, Andrew, um, I, I wanted to talk to you about dog-centered care because I've been um, looking at your uh, Facebook um, page and that was because of the wonderful um, Sue Williamson who came on to talk about, um, well, let's just say dog-centered dog -centered grooming. <laughs> I think that's a good way to describe what she does. And I was very excited about what she does. Teddy, darling, I think it's time for you to be quiet now. I know, thank you. That's, mm -hmm. that's nice. Thank you very much. Um, so she then told me about your work and I thought you must come on Pets Talk. Tell us what is dog-centered care? Well, it's great to be here. Uh, so thank you for asking me along. And uh, so, it's a philosophy really and um i've got a human psychology background so that's uh, I, I work with human in human therapy for i don't know about 12 13 years and then uh, i've been working with animals for about 10 years and uh i've always been really interested in the notion of the emotional experience so just to kind of uh, frame that for your for your listeners the emotional experience we all have one you have one i have one teddy has one the horse has one, the cat has one, Every, we can, we can recognise that we all have one. But the second thing about the emotional experience, and this is the most important thing and the most beautiful thing in, in many ways, is that they're all unique to us as individuals. So uh, people say often, uh, well, you know, we don't know how dogs think and feel, so we will ignore that. We'll just focus on what their behaviour does. But I don't know how you think and feel, Anna. So should I ignore that and just make you do stuff? So um, I took the, the title Dog Centered Care from my human psychology days, uh, when we think about patient centered care, uh, child centered care, and when we think about dog centered care. So it's bringing the dog back into the center of what we do because for a long time, uh, our view for dogs, especially actually interestingly, the last 20, 30 years before that, I think we had I would argue a, a healthier relationship with our animals a little bit because we were just being with them and didn't think about our stuff but a lot of the stuff we've ended up being with dogs is about them doing what we want them to do and them doing our bidding if you like so dog center care is about just trying to readdress that balance a little bit and to recognize for that animal the most important word for me in the psychology of behavior is the word relief um, because that is often what we seek especially when we are presenting to the world what others might perceive as challenging behaviors for the individual, they're just seeking relief. So uh, Dog Center Care is recognizing the beautiful, rich uniqueness of that individual dog in front of us. And how do we best become available to their emotional truth and therefore better at being able to look at their care and support needs. So that's Dog Centered Care really, that's what it is. So it's quite broad thing but it's just anything really that we move away from this notion that somehow the most important thing is just to train a dog it's not that it's not important but it's not the most important thing the most important thing is to think about how we truly support their care and support needs you know that is just why i am so delighted um discovering your work 
because it seems to me that in the same way that we've become more, much more controlling of children, we are also much more controlling of dogs. And then it seems that the whole, that the whole discussion has been about training and thankfully without cruelty. And the whole thing about dominance and you know having to be the pack leader and all of that stuff. But we still had some way to go, it felt to me, because we still needed to consider the dog as being some, you know, uh, some yes. someone who has feelings. And I'm, I'm, I thought twice about using the word someone, but I'm, I'm going to do it. It's, it's someone. And the reason I'm saying someone is because this little someone here does have feelings. And it's very clear that he has feelings. He has a central nervous system like ours. His brain doesn't work that differently to ours. And at the same time, we know if we live with a dog that their reactions are emotional. You know, right now he's feeling a bit frustrated. He's hot, he's bothered, and he's, he's thinking, I want the treats in your hand. That's, that's what he's thinking. And he's going woof and he's turning. It's very, very clear what he's feeling. He doesn't actually have to speak English for me to understand that he's feeling this way. And most people who live with animals can tell how, what their animal is feeling at any particular time. So to have a, a, a dog-centered approach is really important because we want, yes, we want dogs to fit into the human world. And I think that's at the core of what I feel is that we have been so, this the pressure to make them adapt to our world is so great that we're losing sight of the fact that they are dogs and that mm. they are a different species. And, and so it's almost as though, as you say, in our attempts to get it right, we're, we've lost something. No, I think you're right. I think that there's um there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of psychology behind a lot of this, of course, because we're all kind of indoctrinated into what we call the good to bad continuum, which is this is good, that is bad. We'll reward the good, we'll punish or ignore the bad, and that seems to make sense until you start asking questions of who is setting the narrative regarding what is good and bad. And this is where, when we look in the past, you alluded to it there, where we had the notion of children should be seen and not heard. That was very much people in the adult world deciding what that child should or shouldn't do regarding appropriate behavior without necessarily thinking about what that child's emotional care and support needs are. We can, we can stretch that out more and think about the notion that women should be seen and not heard, Anna. That, you know, that is what has happened over a period of time that somehow women were expected to behave in a certain way based upon the narrative, a wider narrative of another. And we've kind of ended up with dogs should be seen and not heard for the same thing. And especially with the advent of the dominance model, with this notion that somehow dogs should fit a certain way of being uh, for them to be a good dog, that notion of a good dog. And I think we had a big explosion around this uh, of the, um, the big commercialization of dog training from the 1980s, probably onwards, where the general public were convinced that the most important thing was to have a well-trained, obedient dog. And this has created a bit of a nightmare because everything then becomes a training or obedience issue. So uh, if you ask the dog to sit and they don't sit, the dog is now being disobedient without thinking, I wonder why the dog can't sit. There could be lots of reasons why the dog can't sit right now. Pain, uh, being overwhelmed, processing something else, not knowing what you're trying to tell them, whatever it is. By making everything into a training issue, therefore, where's the room for that dog to communicate need? And most importantly, to communicate self. When you start thinking of behavior as a communication of a need, a communication of self, um, we realize how difficult it is to have all that kind of compressed down into the control of another. 
So a lot of the general public then, when we think about the, the difference between task and care, I talk about this a fair bit, we can easily get stuck into task and that's dog training, right? The task is the dog will do this. And then, uh, and this is where we end up with all the arguments that we see regarding tools and methods, what's the best way to get that? Without thinking about whether, well, one of the first important questions is, well, should we be even looking to get that? Is that important? Is it that important? But secondly, whether the individual dog is able to do that, or whether it's right or fair for that dog to do that. And this is where we look at things more through a care lens. Now, if you're stuck in task, it doesn't mean you don't care, but the reality, Anna, is if you are, the more uh, focused you are on task, the less care you can give. If, you're, if the task is, I will groom you, regardless of how you feel, I, or, or I will give you this injection, or I will get you to sit or whatever, Where's the care? Where's the thing about waiting for that feedback about can you can you actually do this or not? This is what Sue does so brilliantly, of course, with cooperative grooming, consent-based grooming. It's, it, it's getting the dog. I always think about the dentist, right? Imagine going to a dentist where they just shoved you in the chair. You weren't allowed to speak. You had no view on anything. Every time you showed you might be a bit uncomfortable, they just strap you down more. It doesn't take a huge leap to think that wouldn't be great. So um, this is what it's about, really. It's this thinking a bit more about maybe the task is very much about creating a quiet, compliant dog, which I believe is not the most important thing. The most important thing is a well-regulated dog, especially when we think about what we provide learning experience-wise in that first 12 months for the dog. Because Mother Nature, uh, as humans, we're kind of, we're really focused on structured learning. We, that's why we have schools, right? So, and, uh, and we go to training classes and all that kind of stuff. Mother Nature doesn't care about structured learning much. Mother Nature is really cares about experimental learning and how we learn to self-regulate. All social juvenile mammals are designed to dysregulate. And actually, self-regulation is not innate. We have to learn it. We learn it through experiences. And Molly, who uh, I share a lot about Molly on my stuff, uh, she's our young, she came as a, a rescue pup, uh, 16 weeks. Um, she was a big biter, uh, and I know puppies bite, but she's a big biter. Uh, so we had to work out from her, the expectations was on us, Anna, not on her. Uh, and we learned pretty quickly that uh, even at 16 weeks, she had very specific social processing preferences and social engagement preferences. So we had to support those. And actually, she's a really sensitive dog. So that first six to eight months, we hardly did any training with her, but she was learning loads. We were pre pre presenting to her safe environments where she could process in the way that she wanted to, learn what she needed to learn. Uh, so I think this is the thing for the general public then, uh, we've got this crazy situation because of all the things we've just discussed, where many owners, if not most, know how to teach sit, but don't know what pain looks like in their dog. They know how to teach a downstay, right? But they don't know what stress looks like in their dog. So, uh, so it's not the public's fault. Uh, it's just a lack of awareness because of the huge explosion of emphasis on training as being the thing, the most important thing. And it's not that it's not important, but it shouldn't be the most important thing. It should be about, as well as us building a vocabulary with our dog, that's what training is for me. It's like letting my dogs know, this is what I kind of need right now. But I also need to be able to get feedback from them about what they can do. And that's about me learning to recognize their needs as their caregiver. And it's important. It's, I think, vital from my perspective and clearly yours, that our dogs are happy. If they're happy, they're confident. And I, I had an... Um, an incident a few weeks ago where Teddy was happily walking alongside me um, in the woods um, where we walk most days and so he was happily walking along and we were having a little chat you know um, <laughs> it's we do we have little chats where he's looking at me and I'm saying well, what, is, what is it you need you know what is it you want uh, and I know what he's saying he's going I'd like a treat now, please, um, because I do give him my, he has his lunch as, as we walk so that he's not getting extra treats. So he was, you know, he was looking at me going, I'd like some more of my lunch now, please. And I was going, 
oh really and we were having this little little chat and um a lady walked past in the most complimentary tones and said what's an obedient dog and i i thought oh no 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 <laughs> This is not an obedient dog I, because I don't want an obedient dog. I don't want a robot. I want to have a relationship with my dog. I want him to tell me when he's not happy and to tell me what he wants. And I've worked really hard to try to understand him. And I, have, I know that there's still stuff I'm missing. And so I want to learn more so that I'm always understanding him. So it is this, this idea, isn't it? And we're doing it because there's so much social pressure now to have a well-behaved dog. When we're in a situation where a person only needs to be afraid of your dog, for your dog to be accused of being a dangerous dog, that's, a, that's really quite a scary situation to be in. And I know many of my friends, you know, who get very embarrassed if, they're, if their dog misbehaves that you know barks because they see something that they're afraid of because it so how do we how do we turn this around well it's, 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 it's a, that's quite a big question actually quite a profound one really because of course what i talked about a moment ago about the being kind of indoctrinated into that good to bad continuum and how we're all kind of you know uh Many of us, our behaviours have been pushed through various different kind of uh, conformist filters, uh, and uh, and that comes. That's important, by the way, because of course we've got to have social decency and, and kind of societal norms. I think that's that's important to a point, but uh, there also becomes the point where people uh, can very find it very hard to have their own individual care and support needs met. Uh, you know, as humans, we're not very good at recognizing stress in each other, let alone our dogs, but we're also not very good at recognizing stress in ourselves, right? And I think this is important. And, uh, and we're also really rubbish at communicating emotional need. And that, what a shame that is that we've we come through a, a system and a society that we find it really hard to express emotional need. Uh, and that's mainly because we don't get a re a, an adequate response for it when we do when we're younger. This is that's just another point. But, and I think for me, uh, it's called the process I, 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 I embark on with, with clients, especially, is, is something I call supported awareness. So, uh, you know, there's bigger picture stuff that has to shift because, of course, the, the average person on the street is still blinded by the dominance model because they see it on the telly and you know, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, and But I, I know two things when I meet a client. First thing is many of them, and not all of them, but many of them, their view of their dog's care and support needs is probably 180 away from the reality for the dog. But secondly, that they care for their dog deeply. They want the best. They want to have a bond. All the things that you were talking about, they want that actually. And I find the vast majority of people when they have that supported awareness to actually see the reality rather than what they perceive it to be, it's a relief actually. And you're right, there is a lot of societal stuff that we have to recognize, the law being one of them, and I think that's important. But actually, again, I find that when people truly understand and connect to their dog's care and support needs and they move away from task, they get a lot of those expectations go away then that are attached to task and they shift into care, it's a lot easier to look after and support our dogs because we're already thinking, actually, I won't do that situation because that's more likely to be very difficult for my dog. Um, I'm going to, everything is about slowing the whole process down. A lot of dog training is the opposite, how to do, how to do this faster, especially when we think about a lot of aversive training because it seems to happen very quickly. But I can tell anybody listening now, this is just the reality of aversive training. And I get it because... It seems very alluring, but if we punish a dog for, let's say, their lunging and barking at another dog and we aversively punish them, what we are saying to that dog is very clearly, I don't care how you think and feel right now. The task of you not doing that behavior is more important to me than how you feel. It's just a reality. Anna. And that's the same for all of us, by the way. We have to recognize that, you know, uh, unless anybody's a saint, uh, we all can shout at our dogs sometimes because they, they 
piss off, right? Uh, so, uh, but that's what we do. So, but you know, if the dog is like, <laughs> we're like, we we'll just go lie down for a second. I'm trying to do a Zoom call. It's not the end of the world, and it? it just isn't. But I have just said to my dog, I don't care what you want right now. I need to go lie down. But we say that to our kids. We say that to our partners. You know, so it's not the end of the world. But when we start thinking about true rehabilitation or support or whatever it is we want to call the process, we have to, if we truly care about the dog, understand what it is that their care and support needs are. Uh, and um, and most people do want to do that, and it's a, it is a relief for them. The thing you were talking about a moment ago about uh, how embarrassed people can be by behaviour dogs, and that, and again, there's a psychology behind that. There's something called social evaluative threat (SET), social evaluative threat. And we have a part of our brain that really doesn't, that really wants to avoid social judgment and social exclusion, it's a powerful part of the brain. In fact, it's so powerful, it elicits the same kind of, uh, it's the same similar part of the brain to what we, uh, that fires up when we're in physical pain. So that pain is painful, right? That kind of sense of emotional rejection. So that's why I know it's hard for my clients because when somebody's like, your dog should be this, and your dog should be that or whatever, or they're having those kind of looks when the dog's having a woof, uh, it's really hard for them in that moment. So for me, this is why I love talking about the emotional experience, Anna. It's a recognition that we all have one. So my client's emotional experience is, is just as important as the dog's. Uh, and again, when you start talking in terms of relief, when you start talking in terms of how the brain processes and what the nervous system is doing, the same, I'm, I'm talking the same language for the client. You know, so I, I have two really simple analogies. The first is how the brain processes. So if you imagine that the brain has lots of little doors in it, we need as many doors to stay open for our brain to be able to safely and calmly and rationally process what's going on. Pain and stress are big door closers. And we all know what that feels like. We can all be quite stressed and we just can't think straight. So we haven't got enough doors open, it's as simple as that. And then the nervous system, I, I use the good old bucket analogy because it's a simple one. So the bucket is the nervous system, the water in the bucket is how much the nervous system engages. The fuller the bucket, the less doors are open, the less chance of a mindful, self-regulated, rational response, more chance of that emotional. And this is a really important word, Anna, reflexive, in other words, automatic. And we all, we can all say and do things in the moment when our buckets do fall, that we might apologize or regret later when we calm down. So these are terms when I'm working with my clients, I'm like, God, your bucket must have been pretty full then, right? Or when they say to me, do you know what people said, this, this person said this to me on the walk, and it wasn't until I got home that I, I, I thought about all the witty things I could have said back or all the kind of really clever stuff. And that's because they didn't have enough doors open. It's just some, so now when we look at their dog, they can be like, right, when I'm asking my dog this in that situation and they're not doing it, it's not because they're disobedient. It's either because their bucket's too full or they haven't got enough doors open. And they can start to connect through the emotional experience. So it becomes a powerful thing then. And, and um, we can only really do it a dog at a time until this way of thinking. And I'm not the only person, by the way. I, I, what I tried to do with Dog Center Care was create a group for all these amazing voices. Some of them have been talking about this stuff, Anna, for decades decades, right? People like Sheila Harper, Turi Drugas, um, Sarah Fisher, uh, you know, they're just amazing people. Uh, but because we had such a huge training bias in the, in the industry, in the community, uh, everything was seen that we can, we can train anything. The thing is this about training, by the way, I'm not anti-training, but one thing to bear in mind, we've, we've already discussed about punishment and why that is not uh, helpful, but even positive reinforcement, we have to be really careful that we're not just getting the dog to do something else that we find more appropriate, but still not giving them relief. So when I work with a the dog, then I want to do really good observation so I can try and find out what behaviors would be innately useful for that dog to help that animal self-regulate, not just getting them doing stuff. And we have to be careful that some of the videos I see where people are making assumptions regarding a dog's emotional state, because they're not doing something, doesn't mean that dog has a nervous system at rest. It potentially just means they're more compliant, even through positive reinforcement. Yeah? So this whole thing for me is about how do we better learn the emotional truth of another? It just happens to be another species. Um, uh, but actually animals are really giving of themselves if we give them time to tell us stuff. And it's not the big stuff. You know, I don't wanna see a dog or I, I get very little 
information from a dog who is lunging and barking and growling and biting, all the big stuff. It tells me the dog's stressed for sure, but I want to do observations when that nervous system's lower down. That's why when I first start working with somebody, some people can think, well, why, why aren't we going to take my dog around to the dog sand? Because that's the, that's the problem. But there's so much that dog could tell me before we start thinking about being around things that it finds hard, you know? Uh, and that's the richness that they have for us. And we can learn a lot for sure. Uh, and then if we're gonna use reinforcement, and I do, uh, of course, it's far better to reinforce behaviors that have innate value to the dog and is useful. Well, <laughs> yes, because now we're talking about the motivation, aren't we? And um, with the best will in the world, Teddy is not interested in ball games. There is, he's just not. Does this mean he's not retrieving? Oh, he does retrieve. He brings me my slippers. He, he brings me anything I ask him. If I drop something and I've got my hands full and I ask him to go and get it for me, he will. Um, he will bring me anything I ask him as long as he knows what I'm asking um, very happily. Um, and the reason is because a very long time ago, he learned that that earned him something that he, he likes. So, and he's an enterprising dog. If he's bored, he will go and bring me things. He will go and find things to, to bring to me. So he's motivated to do that. A ball game, it, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, light him up, if I can put it that way. He'll do it two or three times, and then he'll look at me and go, are we done? <laughs> so there's no point in me trying to engage with that any longer. Swimming, his, some, so many of his friends love to swim. Take him to a lake. Teddy only goes in if it's very hot and he's, he's, he thinks, right, this is going to be a good thing to do. So they tell us, they tell us what they like. We just need to, to see what, what they're saying. And, and then we have a real relationship, don't we? Because we're actually, it's a two-way thing. We're listening. And mm. So reinforcement, yeah, I think the reason I, that came to mind is talking about reinforcement and how a dog can still be stressed if they're, if they're not being, if aversives are not being used. And that's, yeah. because, that's because perhaps, you know, we're asking them to do something, even though we're doing it nicely and offering them a reward, but they, they're not into it. They don't want to do it or they're not in the mood right there and then. There's a great experiment done. It's called the Kafir experiment. Kafir experiment by Burgess et al. Uh, and um, uh, they had some children and they introduced kefir, which is a fermented milk drink. Uh, and they had three lots of kids. The first is they gave lavish praise if they drank more. The second had tangible rewards if they drank more. So they got gifts or whatever, whatever it is, I can't remember what they had. But, and the third group, they didn't get anything. They didn't get anything at all. They were just allowed to do their own thing. When they started the experiment, guess what? Those first two groups drank more kefir. That's exactly what we'd expect, right? That's the power of reinforcement, brilliant. But what was different about this experiment was they revisited the kids after a period of time. And the first two groups, had a huge drop off for drinking the kefir, even if the reinforcement was still there. Now in dog terms, we'd think, oh, we need to ramp up the reinforcement because I've got to drink the kefir. The third group who'd had no kind of, uh, um, kind of input at all, actually were drinking more kefir on average because they'd had the time to work it out and I quite like it and I'll have a bit. Now the point here is, this is the point, it's a very powerful one. The first two kids, the first two groups of kids drank more kefir, great, but it didn't mean they liked it. When we think about good old pre-mac, getting a bit technical here, so, uh, when it, so a good example of pre-mac is you can't eat your cheesecake, Anna, until you've eaten your vegetables. We've all been there, right? So that seems fair enough, right? And we use pre-mac a lot, but it doesn't mean that you like those vegetables, you've got to eat them now. But what am I saying to that child regarding agency and choice and what they put in their body. What am I saying to that child about the opportunities or abilities for them to be able to try things in different ways? Now, 
people would say, yeah, but the kids have got to eat the veg. Yes, but there are way more creative ways, this are, for a child to go through exploratory experimental learning than there is just to think, I've got to eat it. Uh, so this is interesting. And, it, and there's, um, there's a great book by Alfie Cohn. It's, it's an oldish book. I don't agree with everything in it, uh, but uh, called Punishment by Reward. And he wrote that when he was thinking about children. So recognizing that there was a big movement towards, uh, there's, there's a lot of similarities in these conversations, Anna, and, you, and you alluded to this earlier, when we look at the development in childhood, childhood educational psychology and development, uh, and how you know that was very much based on an operant aversive or, or, or reinforcement schedule. Really. Uh, and uh, many people realize that actually you can coerce very easily through reinforcement, you know, because the child wants the validation, it wants the, it wants the gold star on the chart. But does that mean that their behavior as an expression of need, behavior expression of self has been identified and supported? Uh, and many of us, when I worked in human therapy, many people as adults, a lot of their struggles was because when they were going through a structured education system where you could definitely get punished for stuff, but also they had to do certain things to get those gold stars, their unique uh, square peg was being pushed into a conformist round hole through that process. So these are challenges for us to think about, and especially when we think about dogs. Now, I look at things very much through a lens of, you know, having been doing training and having fun is great. I'm not a trainer, so I don't, I don't do training. I'm, I'm a, I work with behavioral cases and I specialize in complex ones. Uh, for me, I feel duty bound to find a way of learning that individual dog's truth uh, because um, they will have one. And I've got to be really careful about how I employ the power of positive reinforcement, it is powerful. It is way more powerful than any punishment. Punishment is just a weak option. So this is where I think where these discussions are really important. But also when we start thinking about uh, for the general public, you know, when I, I don't do puppy classes, but I do one-to-ones. And I don't just do a, a couple of week thing, it's a six month support. So I would meet little pup and I support them to that six months. And we hardly do any training uh we do a lot about who is this pup what's this individual pup's processing preferences what does it need to do to feel safe socially how does it need to process the environment so we never have to worry about teaching loose leash walking we don't have to worry about teaching a dog not to jump up because a lot of that stuff is because of elevated young dogs because that nervous system gets too full that's where the jumping up comes from that's where the pulling comes from and it's just looking at things in a, in a different way really uh and also it's difficult if we throw a lot of food at a young dog. So then that young dog is there, eight weeks, comes into the house, starts doing training. We put everything heavily attached to food. So do something good, get some food, do something good, get some food. That's great. But where is that dog though learning inherent self-regulatory behaviors that aren't contingent on the cueing of the caregiver? So it's about getting a balance, Anna, just getting that balance so that when that dog goes through all these difficult development stages, you know, and behavioral maturity in dogs is around two. So it's, it's, it takes a, a lot for them to go through that they have a better chance of thinking, you know, that was difficult, but I can deal with it. Uh, not thinking, you know, what, that was difficult, but I've got no coping strategies because that hasn't been trained to me. So it's just getting that balance a little bit, I think. So how would someone who has... Uh, a mature dog who has been trained in with positive reinforcement go about addressing this issue so it, how do we teach our dogs to self-regulate if they have become overly dependent on us to regulate them is the question I guess I'm asking and that's a really good question and it's a big one as well again and of course that's the bulk of my clients of course because most of my uh, i i don't get to do enough young dog stuff i tend to see the, these dogs who are already older and struggling uh, i specialize in what people might class as reactive dogs i don't like that word very much but, uh, but i class that as dogs who struggle to navigate the social environment that's how i see it and uh often um anything the caregivers have done 
there's a heavy training element. So the dog is often having to be over cued to get them by a situation that they have to keep doing it every time. So uh, for me, it's about stripping everything back and trying to learn from that dog first. So, uh, and even in one session of just not doing much, this is what I love about free work. I don't know whether you've heard of free work, Sarah Fisher. Uh, Sarah would be a great person to have a chat with. But, uh, I love free work because it takes away a lot of the other stuff and it's something very unique and different for the dog because they wouldn't, wouldn't have done it before. So they're not thinking, oh, are you going to cue me now? Or do I have to look at you or whatever? They're just like, oh, this is interesting. And we can learn then things about how does the dog process me? How does the dog process the environment? How does the dog move in the environment? Orientation is hugely important for dogs. Uh, I'm working with a dog, well, I've just finished working with them actually, who used to bark and lunge at other dogs. Um, we did all this kind of thing. They had a very, uh, very obedience bias with their dog. Um, and uh, so the dog had to walk on the one side and had to walk to here when they were out. But if they saw a dog, the dog would bark and lunge. See? When we stripped this back, Anna, and got rid of all this stuff, and I've, I'm lucky because I've got enclosed um, kind of facilities where we can just take our time. We found that when that social environment changed, even with people coming in, let alone dogs, this dog would do some displacement sniffing, which is just kind of, I call it fake sniffing. I'm sure the dog's sniffing a little bit. It's a bit like, do, 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 do. I'm just going to sniff and go away. Uh, so do this kind of displacement sniffing and then move to the left. Did it every time. When we translated that, when we got the dog off a collar onto a harness, long lead, let the dog go out in front. Oh my God. You know, that was quite a big thing for the caregivers. It's like, I've got to go out in front. Um, the dog coped a huge amount better. In fact, almost instantly, we got rid of probably... 80% of those responses because the dog was able to think, you know, I just need to go over to that side to feel safe. So that was huge, right? Uh, now that happened quickly because we unshackled the dog from all the expectational stuff that comes from a training cue response. Some dogs are very indoctrinated now and we need to give it more time. But the beautiful thing here is, what I love about relief, that word, it's the most intrinsically reinforcing thing on the planet. So uh, this is why I use food, but not a huge amount actually, but I use some. Uh, sometimes when, when clients say, yeah, well, my dog won't take food in the environment or whatever else, I think that's fine, we don't really need it because I know if I can work out from that dog, how do you need to do your social, th social threat evaluation to feel safe in the environment? So you can do your social processing first, when they realize that, they feel relief, right? They think, wow, they, they either feel relief because the caregiver's listening to them, they feel relief because they can move the way they need to. That's the most reinforcing thing in the world. And actually we can get in, we can get in the way of that. I see this happen quite a lot actually, where people are doing things where they're using a lot of food and you can see um, a moment where the dog's like, actually my nervous system's come down now. I'm just gonna do a bit of air scenting and I'm gonna process. But they can't because they've just been clicked for something else. So they've got to look away now and get a piece of cheese. So it's actually stopping what they need to do. And if we're going to look at self-regulation, it's about feeling safe to be able to process the information you need first. And this is why we have to separate social processing preferences from social engagement preferences. The two are different. Uh, and uh, it makes sense, right? Because when you think about ourselves, there are things that we want to do regarding social threat evaluation, social processing, that we might not necessarily want to socially engage, or if we do, we want to socially engage on our terms, right? If you imagine a young dog who's quite sensitive, and being sensitive just means that you need more time and space to do processing, that's all it means. Uh, and if you don't, then it's more easy for your nervous system to get overwhelmed. It's as, it's as simple as that for me. Imagine if you're a sensitive dog, socially sensitive dog, especially uh, who's younger and you wanna go through social processing preferences, but everybody you meet wants to touch you. Oh my God, look at the puppy, right? And every dog just runs up to you. There comes a point where you think you either have to adapt very quickly to that, but if you're more sensitive, you're like, you know, I really need to tick these off to feel safe. My adolescent brain is kicking in now and it's saying, look, you're, this, this social world around you isn't giving you the time to do that. Social engagement will be put on you when you're not ready for it. So guess what? We have defensive style behaviors now that start to come out. And that's what we had with Molly, even at 16 weeks. And I, I couldn't believe it really. In a young dog, I'd, I'd not had a, a young dog who was so definite about how she wanted the world presented to her. Um, so... 
Now, if she'd have gone to uh, somewhere else, there would have been a training summit. Oh no, we must make sure that she walks nicely on the leash and we must make sure this, and all these kind of things. And I'm not saying they're not important, but are they, were they important to Molly? No, <laughs> this is the thing. We've got to recognize how much we do has a very little value to the dog. A lot of what we do. And you know, that business about training them to walk on a lead and walking to heel was an utter nightmare for me because Teddy is a lively dog who, and I, I feel he does not like to be constricted, restrained, limited. And he was very, very impulsive as a puppy. I think more so than, even more than your average cockapoo, I would say. Um, just looking at his friends and looking, he was more impulsive. And I, I had a choice. I can either be miserable, make him miserable, or I can run with him. And I decided to let him run. And I, I used to run with him. I don't know if it was the right, the best thing to do, but I know it worked for us. And, and I, I noticed that he was more likely to want to do that at the start of the walk because, and I feel, I felt that, and at the time I, I really, I was very new to the dog world, but I felt what he needed was he, need, he wanted to sniff everything at once to feel safe. Mm. And, and I, I felt it was wrong to stop him from doing that, that it was going to make him very stressful. So I used to, I decided that I would run with him. Um, and, and so I chose to, to do that. I would walk, uh, walk with him. If I was going to walk out my front door, I would do it at a time of day when it was not so, so busy so that it wouldn't be a menace to anyone. And I would just run uh, with him. And he, and, you know, sometimes he would stop. And of course, you know what that's like if you've been on the lead with a dog and, and the dog's running and suddenly he stops and you go rushing forward. And, but we, we found our way. And then on the way home, he was much calmer. And that's when I would do the, you know, the training um, because he was much more receptive to that at that point. Um, and, and, and that just worked for us. And I say, I always say, I didn't really get any sense out of him in the first eight months. After, at eight months, when he first cocked his legs, suddenly he was, he was more willing to take a slower pace, if I can put it that way. Um, so it, it worked for us and, and that was, it took the pain away and I didn't feel that I was imposing anything on him. But mm. I really feel for people and puppies who have this pressure to walk nicely on the lead when the puppy has other ideas. And it's really important because so many, so many things you said there are really, really important points because sniffing definitely, you know, when we think about a lot of what, are the, the, a lot, a lot of what the general public do with early training is about hear this, see this, hear this, see this, not sniff that. So we're already taking away a really important part of that dog to do processing, especially the processing they need. So sniffing is important. And also, uh, the part of the dog's brain that helps them to moderate their behavior doesn't come online till the end of adolescence, Anna. So some of those doors aren't even open, right? So we're asking a huge amount. And for me, pulling on the lead especially is a, is a, is a clear correlation to nervous system elevation. So that can be excitement, of course, whatever it is, but that's what creates a lot of stuff. So, um, uh, and this is why many people really struggle. They go to the dog training in the village hall, great. Dog walks the hill, great. In the garden, dog walks the hill, great. When they walk outside, the dog's struggling down the road because the dog is too elevated in the environment. And with Molly, we live on a beach here. I can see the beach from here. Uh, it's really lovely. And she was, she didn't see the beach until she was about nine months old because it would have been too much. And yet so many take, people take, because they think, well, I've got to get my puppy used to everything. So I must go down the beach. Um, it just creates this elevated dog a lot so that when that young dog's in puppy brain, they're 100 miles an hour, right? They can do fast really easily. We have to invite them to 
recognize the, the joy and benefit of slowing things down. So with Molly, we took her to like, there's an orchard up near here uh, where we could just either have her on the, off the leash or on a long line so she could get used to mooching around. This is what I do with my client's dogs. So they don't have to teach loose leash now because the dog really values just sniffing and slowing down. It's, it's looking at these kind of things. But I think what I love what you said there about, you said, well, I don't know whether it's right, but it was, but it worked for us, it's right for us. And that's really important because there is no rights and wrongs ultimately. I think part of the problem is, as well as we created this notion of the dog. This is how dogs behave. This is how dogs learn. But who are the dogs? It's a bit like when politicians talk about the people. Well, who are the people? You know, uh, so Teddy is a unique, beautiful, rich, complex one-off, right? He just happens to be a cockapoo. He happens to be a boy. He happens to be a dog. But he's a teddy, right? And this is the beautiful thing. And this is why I love again about talking about the emotional experience, because at the heart of the emotional experience is recognizing that it is unique to us as individuals. You, you and I, Anna, could be at the same place, doing the same thing at the same time and be affected by it very differently. That's the beautiful thing about it. So you did what was right for you and Teddy. And, and sadly, especially on social media, people put stuff out there, especially caregivers, they put their personal experience, then all the professionals dive in and say, oh, this is... but you know, that's what they did. And, uh, and, uh, and that's what they, that's how they felt that connection and it worked for them. So um, there are no absolutes Anna, apart, apart from kindness. That's something my husband says often, there's no absolute but kindness. And I think that's, that's what we should think about really. Actually, I, I like that because that is the, my, primary concern is I want Teddy to feel confident and happy and he doesn't always you know he doesn't always feel confident and happy um we saw earlier in, in when we started the talk he was feeling a bit hot and bothered and so he's he's been he's been allowed to leave the room quietly without disrupting the the interview um, so I've, I've arranged that while this was happening so that he could actually leave the room um, and, and go downstairs where he might be feeling more comfortable, hopefully be feeling more comfortable. Um, but that's, it's a simple thing. And then, and there are the, the things that are more difficult. And I think a lot of it is pressure on the, on the human side of the relationship to have the dog behave in a certain way and the pressure could be and this is a classic one and parents will recognize this because it's the equivalent of having to get children ready for school in the morning mm. when they have no concept of time you know they want to they want to do this they want to do that they want to do everything but get ready for school and the clock is ticking and the parent has to get them to, has to go to work and get them to school so that they can go to work and it's the same thing as with, with dogs sometimes, wanting them to, the pressure of time, uh, get to the groomer on time, get to an appointment on time, get to the um, daycare on time, whatever it is, and we're wanting our dogs to rush. And, I, and what you said there about the dog not being able really to, the equivalent, of, I think, of being able to reason, before a certain amount of time, because the brain's not fully developed, it's exactly the same as children. We know that until the age of seven, they don't really have the same ability to reason that we have, because the brain has physically not developed enough. And we begin all of this with, with, with puppies. And because we, we say, okay, well, they need, to be, they need to be trained early on. They need to be exposed to everything that's going to be part of their lives early on. Okay, yes, but they're still puppies and the brain's not fully developed. So we have to really think carefully, I think, about how to manage things best, allowing them. And that's why, and you were talking about um, ACE, Free Work, and Sarah Fisher, who I've had the absolute joy of interviewing for Pet Talk. Mm. Brilliant. Oh, good. I didn't see that. I saw um, uh, Sue's chat, but I didn't know you yeah. were there. So that's great. Yeah, brilliant. And I just, I love that approach. And being, to me, that is absolute magic to look at Sarah working and how she reads a dog's body is magic to me. 
I, and I want to know. That was the, the first time I met her was at a, at a workshop that I was very happy to be part of. And she was talking about tea touch, Tellington touch. And she, she was, I think Teddy at that point was maybe a year and a half. And she took one look at him and she said, look what he's doing. And I thought, oh yeah, you know that ear thing where you know the ears go back? I don't know how to do that with Teddy because he's got floppy ears. And, and she said, oh yeah, she said, that's okay. Here's how you do it. I just, I hung on her every word because I was so wanting to know how to read his body. And so it's, it's such an important thing to, to be able to say to a dog, okay, here's a variety of things. What would you like to do and watch them? Let's see the beauty of things. So Sarah, uh, I'm very, uh, very lucky to have Sarah as a, as a, as a, as a friend, as well as a colleague. And um, uh, she is, for me, probably the biggest inspiration on me professionally, actually, uh, over the years. And, and she is um, showing us the importance of learning from the dog first. And giving ourselves time, it just, it just, you know, uh, we can learn a lot from a dog. In I, I normally learn a huge amount from a dog in that first ten minutes, actually, because uh, I can see where that nervous system is for the dog. I can see how they're processing or not, or what the kind of situations might be. But especially when we give them time uh, to be able to tell us a story, and when you think about it, Anna, there is not really any difference between me and you and the dog and the cat, other than these are big things I know. Species specific need and species specific ways of communicating need. Everything else is kind of not that important uh, regarding different differences, subtle or otherwise, because ultimately that animal will have need. So we either ignore need and we just get them to comply or we try and recognize need, but it's the same with kids. And, and you're absolutely right. You know, uh, a lot of this stuff, you know, when we think about some of the TV shows like Super Nanny, that kind of thing, it all looks great, naughty steps, that kind of thing. But, but what are we teaching that? There's a huge difference between what we are taught and what we learn, huge difference. So when we think I'll oh, teach that child a lesson because we think we're teaching that child a lesson by doing that. What is that child actually learning though? So, um, uh, for example, we might, uh, if that child is their behavior that the human has decided, the adult, sorry, <laughs> human, um, the adult has decided that the child is playing up or having a tantrum or being demanding or whatever. That's, they've already decided that. So they're gonna teach the child a lesson by saying, if you do that, you're gonna have to sit on the naughty step. So now we feel the child has learned that if they do that, they're going to end up on the doorstep, and if they don't, they won't. So the child has been taught that lesson, great. But the child also, though, has probably learned, nobody listens to me when I try and communicate need, or the answer to uh, uh, trying to communicate need is exclusion, uh, uh, whatever, it could be a whole list of stuff. So we talked about earlier, why is it that as adult humans, we are really bad at communicating emotional need? We'll just give them one possible example right there, right? So the difference between what we're taught and what we learn, and, and I would ask anybody listening to think back to when they were at school and to think about what they remember from a structured educational point of view. Um, and the answer is probably not much. There are some things that we remember that add value to us, like reading and writing, for example, or some, some particular subjects that we really love. But most of it, we'll have forgotten it, right? What we still remember, though, very, very viscerally, is what we learned from that experience regarding experimental learning. How did we connect to our peers? Did we feel safe? How did we connect to authority? So these are really important things we've got to recognise, Anna. Uh, that difference between what we are taught and what we learn. Okay, so this is all very well. And as a, as a, as a clinical hypnotherapist, I can completely hear, you know, what you're saying. But 
there are still things that need to happen. There are still things that need to be done. And the fact of the matter is we can't have our, I'm just hearing what people might say. We can't have our dogs dictating to us. We can't pander to them. And, you know, and, and as I said earlier, there's the pressure of time, for, for example, and we don't always have time to let them sniff every blade of grass on the way to the car where the car is parked. Andrew, this is not practical. It's not the real world. You know, I think uh, I remember being at a, a multi-agency meeting with a uh, vulnerable young adult and their mother. And I remember uh, the, somebody was there, I think it might have been the police, I don't know, but anyway, he was saying that all these things have to change, right? Uh, and the mother said, and it stuck with me, um, are we gonna look at the fact that my daughter has to hold on to, has to bear all the things that have gone wrong for her? Or is the problem the system that my daughter has to try and fit into? And it was quite profound. And I just thought I'd provide that because yes, there is always compromises to be had, uh, but this is why we need a big perception shift. So we've got to recognize the damage we do by trying to force into a conformist mold, a another, that includes the dog. Now, many dogs, as it happens, muddle through all this and they do all right. And that's great. Right. Uh, sadly, though, I think a lot of dogs are are um, uh, in servitude a little bit. Uh, you know, this really hot weather. My husband and I were out this morning, and so many dogs were just sweltering, sat under a cafe table because the caregivers want to go out and have a cup of coffee and take the dog. Right, regardless of what their dogs' care and support needs are right now, and a lot of this is just lack of awareness. But yes, yeah, so, so this thing is, it's about a perception shift, and we always have to find. A compromise we call it alignment really so i have my needs i want and the things i want to do with my dogs my dogs have their care needs we've got three dogs now so you know there's a lot of nervous systems at play here so we find that compromise and that thing we we have to make a choice we either think you know what i'm just going to make sure that things happen the way i think they need to happen or we allow another nervous system chance to be able to let us know what their care and support needs might be and it's about looking at environment it's about looking at need it's about looking at context you know there are situations where my dogs do what I need them to do because I need to keep them safe and they might not like it but we're going to do it and it's not the end of the world that's the point uh, there are times when I need my dogs to do something and they are telling me where they can't so I'm thinking okay let's think about what's going on in this situation then how do I maintain manage this environment Arthur is my sensitive boy very sensitive uh and he's 11 now and he's still sensitive he'll always be that this is the point you know that a lot of this stuff regarding sensitivity to kind of confidence is pretty innate uh we went somewhere recently with the three dogs and most of the time arthur's fine on this particular day we were at a friend's barbecue they got a really nice big garden quite a few people there he was struggling Anna. so i had a choice then this, it does come down to choice so anybody listening the question you asked it comes down to i could have thought you know you're gonna have to stay here because this is what i need from you but I chose to bring him home and, I, and my husband stayed with the other two and that's what we do. So this isn't about absolutes, it's about a changing view and it's just giving the dog at least some agency, some say in things and most importantly giving them the time to communicate what those care and support needs might be. Sometimes uh, I, I gave a talk recently with Dr Holly Tett and Dr Laura Donaldson uh, and myself, the three of us, we, we did it as a workshop, looking at three really important words, connection, freedom, and safety. So each, so this is done over three workshops because each word is a big word and we both talked about it. And for me, those are the three words that are always in friction based on what you just said there about people might think things because a lot of times, you know, I spoke to a lady recently and she was going on about dominance and obedience and discipline and all these kind of words that we don't like, right? But I think it's really important to hear people talk with the vocabulary they have, it's really important. And what she really meant we worked out together was that she wanted to keep her dog safe. And that's important. So safety, connection and freedom. 
you can't have all three very easily. There is a compromise somewhere, you know, because, uh, uh, and uh, so that's what it's about. It's just about recognizing the reality for, for the dog, I think. Yes, because with the best will in the world, um, I can't let Teddy do whatever he wants because he would not be alive today if yeah. I allowed him to do whatever he wanted. Because as I, I mentioned earlier, he was so impulsive as a puppy, he would have been hit by a car or he would have got lost and, and, then, and then thought, oh, I'm lost. Um, or he would be obese because he would eat everything in his path. So any of those three things would be his fate if I did not recognize that of the three of us, I have the bigger picture. And that, therefore, I have to be responsible for him. So there's no question about that. But within that, I want to give him as much freedom as is safe for him to have. And, and you know, I keep coming back to, to time and time pressure. Because very often, one of the things that I notice is that people want their dogs to respond to a cue or a command as they might see it or you know, very, very quickly. And I can see Teddy working out what I'm asking him to do. So one of his little things is that he tidies up after himself, after breakfast. And you know, I'm, I'm, preparing, I'm preparing my own breakfast, it involves fruit, he loves fruit. And he does the cute thing. He, we, he has, a, he has um, one, lots of different puzzles, food puzzles. And many of them have lids and little things that come off them. So one of the things he likes to do, and he initiated this, I never did, was he tidies up after himself because he worked out that if he brings me something, he's going to get a little bit of fruit. He loves that. Of late, he's, he's become less interested in tidying up after himself. But I might say to him, oh, are you going to tidy up this morning? I've never, these are not words. He understands tidy up time because that was introduced when he was very little um, as a way of, of saying the game is over or, oh, that was it. He used to like to play with the laundry and rather than turn the laundry into a, an absolute no, I realized all he really wanted to do was sniff it and lie on it. So when it was time for me to start loading the dish, uh, the washing machine, because I'd had the laundry sorted into different piles, I'd say tidy up time. So very early on, he learned that tidy up time means that an activity is ending. And he also le learned that it meant that I was picking things up and taking them somewhere. That later on it got, more elaborate and it turned into him helping to load the washing machine so and that's that was him you know again he wanted to participate so I'd give it he's going to put it in the machine and then he put it put in the machine and get a little reward for it and so when he's in the mood he he helps if he's not in the mood he doesn't so that's fine but so recently I've said to him are you going to tidy up this is a completely new context for me to use that phrase. I'm not going to expect him to immediately know what I'm saying, but I know him well enough to know that he will work it out. So I stand back and I watch him and I can see his brain's going tidy up. Mm, yeah, I have a vague idea of what that means. Oh, yeah, she's looking at my little lids on the floor. Yeah, I know what that means. Yeah, I think I'll do that. And he goes and does it. It takes him maybe eight to 10 seconds, but I can see him working that out in his mind. And I love watching his brain work. I, I just would say that if we give them that time to work things out, it's joyous to watch them do it. It is, and I think that one thing to bear in mind um, is that especially when Teddy's doing that, he's in quite a well-regulated state at the time. And that's the key. And I think, um, 
Uh, and the joy of seeing a dog work stuff out and have internal value to something and really connect to something is beautiful. What happens sometimes is with, especially the more obedience outlook is, the it, often or uh, the, the, the whole situation is very stuck in task. You know, you will do this because, you know, rather than what you described there, which is him connecting various dots in his head and bringing those kind of things to the fore and making a connection. And learning should be that. I think learning has to be, we know that unless we're in a well-regulated state, we can't learn, we can't learn very well. We can, we can do things under pressure. That doesn't mean we necessarily take it in and we have value to it. And I think uh, this is something that the general public don't know enough about, because as I say, they can ask their dog, like you said a moment ago, they expect the dog to do it, do it quick. Uh, they're kind of sold this notion because of all the, all the Facebook stuff we see, the kind of courses and that kind of thing, get 100% recall and all that kind of thing. There is no 100%. I can tell you, in my early psychology career, I worked with um, people from the services who are trained extremely well, but their training can and does fail if they're not in a well-regulated state, if that emotional state overwhelms them. And it's no different for a dog. And I think this is important, especially when they're younger, like you say, you know, so it's no point it's barking orders at the dog and expecting them to, especially if they're already in an elevated state, you know. Uh, so I think training should be, training for me is teaching. Uh, it's about building a vocabulary. It's about building that kind of response. It's about me saying, I'll learn about how you need to communicate and I'll help you to learn how I need to communicate. And then it becomes beautiful. And the things you talk about with Teddy, these, these, these kind of spontaneous little moments. And also, you know, we know there's been lots of studies on this. Uh, a dog's vocabulary, the bit that we teach through structured education, is a fraction of what they actually learn. Look at Kathy Gregory's work with free will training, which is just talking to dogs and, and using the same language and how dogs attach to it. Most of the stuff that gets my dogs really excited are words I've never deliberately trained for them. But, and, they, and they're really good at thinking, if I hear that word, especially at this time of day, so I have a, my husband goes nuts for me because I, I always say, I always say, right before we do anything but my dog's like oh my god that's walk time because it's that time of day i could say right at like three in the afternoon nothing happens but they say in the morning they think now it's time to go because that's when dad does stuff so they're amazing aren't they they, they join so that's what i said earlier there's a big difference what they're taught and what they learn they're learning all the time all the time they certainly are and i am so grateful for our conversation today if people want to contact you or learn more about your work, how do they do that? So come to the Dog Centre Care uh, Facebook group. You know, it's, it's a public group and uh, I share my stuff there, but so does a lot of other people. Uh, I have um, chats with some amazing people uh, that are on the Dog Centre Care YouTube channel. I can give you the links for these kind of things. They're all there, it's all free. Um, the whole thing is, you know, uh, there's lots of groups out there for dog training. I say dog training is cool. I'm not against dog training at all. But this is about thinking about more. So we have experts who come along and talk about trauma, who talk about um, uh, early development, who talk about, uh, we had a, a great lady talking, uh, came in recently, Mandy uh, Wilson, who was talking about the learning experience. So she actually comes from a human education background, mm -hmm. working a lot with uh, children who are, uh, either non or pre-verbal um, and looking at the difference between attainment and achievement within learning all these kind of principles they're really great Anna it gives us a bigger richness really and takes a lot of pressure off us actually a lot of the stuff you were talking about earlier when you asked that really fundamental question about people saying well you know I can't allow a free for whatever a lot of that is about us unshackling ourselves from the expectations and judgments of others and actually just allowing ourselves to sit with our dog and think, right, let's let's meet properly now. Let's put all this other stuff out of the way. Let's meet properly. Indeed. And and for and that's why I absolutely loved finding your, your Facebook page. And I I love what you do. So thank you so much. I will be putting the information, the links um, on the description box to this. Um, wonderful interview, along with the link to the interview I did with Sarah Fisher for viewers who missed that the first time round. Yeah, 
Any, it, any opportunity to hear Sarah, please yes. take it. She's an inspiration <laughs> for sure, yeah. Um, so thank you so much, Andrew, for joining us on Pep Talk today. Thank you, Anna. And thank you, Teddy. I know he's gone off to do other things, but it's great, it's great to see you. <laughs> oh, and thank you all for watching. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>